Hey everyone, Richard Robbins here. I hope you're doing well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, this episode was so cool. I so much enjoyed this conversation because it was actually um, a lot that I learned in this conversation with Mr. Keith Roy. Now, I want to set this up. I actually did a podcast with Keith before, and it was episode number 17. It was called Take Eight Months Off and Still Learn a Million Dollars a Year. So Keith is always doing new things. Now, let's face it. He has a very successful real estate business. But back when I did the first recording, he had just finished taking eight months off, somewhat of a sabbatical, and his business was still a great success. But he's now taken it to a whole nother level. Yes. He is now the conservative, okay, the conservative party of Canada. Uh, Canada. He's now the candidate uh, leading up to the election that is happening in the fall of 2025. So he is now the candidate for West Vancouver all the way out to Whistler, which is pretty cool stuff. So here's what my conversation was about. And I found it so interesting. So think about this. All of a sudden, you decide you're going to try to be the candidate. How does that all happen? What's the process? How do you get elected? Because it started about six months ago from the time, actually more than six months ago from the time of this recording. So imagine he had to go out and he had to door knock. He had to meet with influencers. And in some ways, it's sort of just like starting a real estate business, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, he met with uh, Pierre, obviously the leader of the party, talked to him as well. And it was just such a cool conversation for at least me, and I hope you'd understand what goes on to become a candidate. And now that he is the candidate, what goes on to try to win his writing? And he will take you through the whole process, what the, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada recommends that he does between now and the election in the fall of 2025. But not only that, He's spending a lot of time doing that while he's still running his real estate business, which is pretty cool. So I think what you're going to get from this, it is quite amazing the sacrifice that many of these people make to become the candidate because they don't get paid and he'll take you through this whole process. And of course, they're not spending as much time uh, at their business, which his is real estate which means there's a massive sacrifice there as well. So I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation uh, with Keith Roy. And what I took from it was really becoming the Conservative Party of Canada candidate and now trying to be the winner of your riding. It is just like starting and running a business. So please, without further ado, please enjoy this uh, really cool conversation with Mr. Keith Roy. It's time to build an extraordinary business and a beautiful life with some of the best leaders and minds in the world. Welcome to The Richard Robbins Show with international speaker, best-selling author, and business mentor, Richard Robbins, as he brings his relentless commitment to excellence with in-depth interviews, insights, and experience to help you produce real, outstanding results. Keith, my friend, welcome to the show, buddy. Uh, happy to be back, Rich. Well, that is right, because you were on episode number 17. I didn't know I had you on that early. You must be really good or something like, you know. Well, I, I think you actually didn't have a big pool to pull from in the early uh, days. You were less of a big deal back then. So I was yeah. a, I was an ideal candidate for that. Him. That could be. Who knows? <laughs> but I remember we titled your last one. It was eight months off and earn a million dollars a year. Do you remember that? Yeah. And. It was uh, it was very popular because that was back when you took that really cool sabbatical and and all that sort of thing and and I wanted to have you back because <clears throat> well you and I've talked about this many times over the years and I've always said you should be a politician I just think you're you're a very sharp thinker you're a very articulate communicator uh, you have very good common sense and very good opinions on things and. Um, so now, I don't know what we're going to title this one, but maybe we'll title it Realtor Turned Politician. What do you think? Well, I'm, I'm working on that. I'm, I'm Realtor Turned Candidate at this point. <laughs> which, is, which is really cool. Now, you know, it's, what I want to talk about today is I got two things I want to talk about. I want to talk about the journey because you're now the candidate for the PC party, the Conservative Party. Federal Conservative Party. Federal Conservative for uh, West Van out to Whistler. Is that correct? 
Yeah, it's it's the second longest named riding in the country. It's actually called West Vancouver Sunshine Coast Sea to Sky Country. <laughs> That's right. And you, this you is, can turn that into an acronym, you know. <laughs> we we tried, but it's it's actually a really confusing one because it's W V uh, S C C S T S. <laughs> so even that, like even that, doesn't work. So I just I say the whole thing. I want to be respectful of all three parts of the riding. Yeah. What happens? This riding is what happens when government makes decisions from Ottawa out. So when they right. were doing redistribution, they were reading the country from the center out. They got to the Pacific Ocean and they're like, well, we're kind of out of people. There's about 130,000 people who live roughly in this geographic area. Let's call them a riding. And it's it's functionally three small ridings in one. Um, there are three very distinct ridings. You've been I know you've been to two of the parts, maybe even the third on the Sunshine yeah. Coast. But it's it's three very different places, um, yeah. but that that is an Ottawa decision of how those boundaries get made. Well, first of all, I think it's very very cool that you're doing this, and I mean that, uh, and I wish you all the success in the world. And I want to talk about, you know, your interest in it, how you got started, what it took to become the candidate, because, you know, I think. A lot of people don't understand what you had to do and the sacrifices that you have made and are making. Um, and then the second thing I want to get into is, you know, you still got a real estate business to run. So, you know, you look at it and say, well, how do you do that? How do you take all this time, you know, to get out there, press the flesh, you know what I mean? Meet all these people, you know, do talks to small groups and larger groups of people you know, the whole process, right? You know, you're starting all over again. It's like you're you're prospecting, right? Not everybody or very few people knew who you were and you got to go out there. And and uh, it's cool that you are now the candidate. You you won, which is wonderful. Um, so take us through the journey. That's yeah. what I'm really interested in. Well, the, the obvious question I get is, you know, why why do you want to be a politician? How did you end up in, in politics from real estate? And the question I used to get was, how did you end up in real estate with a political science degree? And my answer for this has always been the same. Politics and real estate are the same thing. I knock on doors, I put signs in yards, and I represent people. <laughs> and and nobody likes either profession. So I'm already used to the negative press. So it's actually a relatively natural, the, the business of politics, if we can call it that, the work that goes on into getting elected is not entirely dissimilar from real estate. It's large networks, it's knowing people, it's asking for referrals and introductions, it's small group gatherings. Um, the, the work is not entirely different. But I've always, as you know, always had a, a passion for politics. It's always been where I've spent my volunteer time um, helping to, I think, improve the country. I have deeply held conservative values that came from, uh, they started in university, I, I grew up out West, but I went to the University of Guelph in Ontario, and in first year political science class, I was listening to Ontario people talk about the country, and this is the early 2000s, um, so Cretchen's in power, and they're talking about the country, and, and the West was an afterthought, and I realized that I was actually an alienated Westerner at the time, and I, I couldn't believe that people in Ontario didn't understand how we thought differently out on the West Coast. Um, let alone the prairies, which is a whole other thing. And so I fell in with the the then Canadian Alliance, which ultimately merged into the Conservative Party with Stephen Harper as leader. Um, during university, I interned for a member of parliament, and I got to spend a summer in Ottawa working on Parliament Hill, seeing politics behind the scene. And I didn't want to go work in politics. And a lot of my friends went and took jobs in politics. But I always held really strong convictions. And uh, I... I was always a conservative, but I didn't. I never made a living in politics. I went off and started a real estate practice. Um, we're going to be listening to this sometime in the middle of the year, but it, in May long weekend, 2024, is my 18th anniversary in real estate. I'm up for my, my license renewal right now. So I've been doing this now for 18 years. Uh, Parliament, to me, I've always viewed as an act of service. I've always believed that when you're at a point in life where you have an opportunity to give back, you should you should go do that in some way, shape, or form. And the the country over the last number of years, particular you know through and post COVID, has been really, really bad. Um, it's and as a realtor, uh, we experience this in people's houses. We're having to help people go through divorces. 
we realize how on the edge people are with their finances. Um, we get brought in when there's promotions and you know new jobs and job losses and debts in the family. So I'm spending my life in other people's lives. I'm recognizing these problems and I'm realizing that I have a lot of the solutions that I think would be necessary. So it's always kind of been on my radar as something to do. It's not, it's not something at that. Parliament shouldn't be something aspirational. It, it, it shouldn't be the thing that you just, you want to accomplish that. And that's your end goal. For me, I want to accomplish some, some policy changes. I'm in the middle of my life. I'm 42. Uh, I can give back for, you know, two or three terms. And then I'm going to go back and run my, run a, run a business again. That's, that's naturally who I'm. I'm a business person who wants to give back. So to your question about how does this how does this play out? In order to become a member of parliament, you first need to get a nomination from a, a party. The Conservative Party is obviously my party. The Conservative Party um, has free, fair, and open nominations, so anybody can apply. You get vetted by the party, and the vetting process is quite comprehensive. There's a criminal re- it's it, it's kind of like applying to be a realtor. There's a criminal records check. Uh, there's uh, financial disclosures. There's, uh, you know, they they look at everything you've said and everything you've tweeted and everything you've been on video about. And for me, a lot of that is just housing policy. And I've been really, <clears throat> I've been really consistent over the years about my housing policy. So that all lined up. So you're vetted, and then the goal is to just sell memberships, and you have to go and convince people to pay fifteen dollars and join the Conservative Party. And come out and support you on a nomination day. And you don't even, you, I didn't even know when the nomination day was. I just had to start selling memberships. And I'm already in sales, so I'm used to that, but it's a very different selling process than selling real estate. So okay, in real so estate, let's go, back, let's go back a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> so you decide that you want to run to represent the Conservative Party. Okay. What is your next step? Do you have like you literally fill out an application? Is that what happens? Yeah. So before I decided to run, I asked myself, is this something that I want to do? And I explored that. And then I asked Stephanie, is this something we want to do? We had a a number of friends who are currently members of parliament, some of whom have young children we had them come visit us at our home and Stephanie got to spend time with the spouse of a member of parliament who also has young children. What does this look like from a lifestyle perspective? Well, how will this impact our family dynamic? What does this mean for our son, Kai? Then I said, would I be the right person for this riding? And it's a crazy diverse riding and I have connections in all parts of it. So I toured the riding and I, I met with different people uh, political leaders, as well as just kind of some average Conservative Party members, um, elected officials in those different ridings to figure out what the problems were. Would I be the right person to reflect those problems in Ottawa? Then I went to Ottawa and I sat down with, um, I, I've known Pierre for 22 years. Uh, Pierre gave me some of his time, which is pretty rare for the uh, leader of a party to make himself available to a nomination candidate. I met with most of the other members of the British Columbia caucus of the Conservative Party. Um, Andrew Shear, the former leader, spent he's now the House leader. He spent half an hour with me in his office. And I my question for them was, if I do this, am I going to be a valuable member of the team? Do I have a skill set that you are missing that I could be a, a contributor, a contributory member of a new government? And so obviously the answer to all of these came back as yes. And that's when I decided to, you know, throw my hat in the ring, um, so to so to speak. And I won a nomination against two other very qualified individuals. One was a, a former mayoral candidate from West Vancouver who had been a sitting councillor and had he was the number one vote getter on city council in West Vancouver in the 2018 election. And um a a physician, an emergency room physician who was also an army doctor, like phenomenal resume, um, eminently qualified people. And I went out and, you know, ultimately sold more memberships, got more votes, 
ran a better campaign and finished off with, you know, 62% of the vote um, in a three-way race. So, uh, but we, we had to go and do that, that grunt work. And it was, Rich, I knocked on doors. I knocked on a couple hundred doors. There's mm-hmm. 1,800 Conservative Party members in our riding. And I had to knock on their doors and introduce myself. And then I had to convince them like one-on-one in like 30 minute conversations with every person that I was the right person to reflect their values, to be the candidate, to go in the general. Uh. Because in real estate, like you think you, okay, you do a listing presentation, they're buying you, they're buying your services, you've got your brand to rely on. In a nomination, you don't have a brand because I'm not the conservative candidate. I'm one of a few conservatives. I'm literally just out there. Am I the right guy for you? And would I be the guy to to sell the conservative message in a general election? And then at the end of that you know, presentation, you get a vote. You don't even get a listing out of it. Like, at least a listing I can pay my bills with. Uh-huh. But this was just a vote. And we had to get hundreds of them. So it was 1,800, it was 1800 members in the riding, right? Yeah. So you get 1,800 members in the riding. So what you have to do, being an unknown, a complete unknown, yeah, you have to somehow, some way, go influence those 1,800 people to get their vote. Now, what was the time frame that you had from when you started to when the vote was going to be? My opponent started in May of 2023, and that's when I realized I was going to have to make a decision. So I took summer of 2023 to go to Ottawa and make, you know, do my rounds. And I kind of decided September of 24 and our membership cutoff ended up being January 17th, uh, sorry, September 23. Our, our membership cutoff was January of 2024. So I had about a four month window to really push this out. Right. And it's, look, here's the, here's the real estate lesson for people. I, I had to go sell memberships. Well, how do you sell memberships? I asked for referrals. So I'd find people who were already members and I say, is there anyone else in your home who's over 14? Because anyone 14 and over can join the party. And who else do you know who shares our values that would be willing to sign up and come out and vote for me in the nomination? And we worked a we worked a referral-based business. I ran the the LRS as as you've called it for years. I ran the LRS as a political campaign. Huh. It, cool. It's the same thing. Like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna plug your competitor. Brian Buffini runs the the mayor campaign. He's he's pitched this for years. And politics and real estate are the same thing. It's it was the same formula. So I just overlaid everything I'd learned from 18 years of Richard Robbins coaching onto a political campaign. That's that's really cool. So the you had basically four months, correct? Yeah. Four four hard months, kind of seven seven months in total to win the nomination. And then you said sell membership. So I had to sell, you know, the most memberships, but the, the members get to vote. So the reason you're selling memberships is if you sell them a membership, you're hoping to get their vote. Is that the way this works? As yeah, well so as when, 1800. It, when it started off, the membership was say it was a thousand people. And by the time the vote came, it was 1800. Gotcha. So myself and my opponents had gone out and gotten our networks together and convinced our people to join the party to come and vote for us. Right. You you have to both sell more memberships than the other people, but then you have to convince your people to come out and vote for you on that one day when voting happens in right. person. Oh, where's the vote take place? So our riding's so big, we had three three days of voting in four locations. Thursday night in the Sunshine Coast. Um, and here's here's... Here's an interesting kind of example of how crazy this is. So voting's happening, I think it was 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. in Gibsons, which is the south end of the Sunshine Coast. At the north end of the Sunshine Coast is a fishing village called Pender Harbor, and it's about an hour away. I had done a lot of work in Pender Harbor with the commercial fishermen. They've got a lot of issues with the federal government around total allowable catch and marine park protection areas and dock infrastructure, all these minor issues on the coast, but very important issues and livelihood issues for these these fishermen. So I had worked with a lot of them and a lot of them had signed up to support me. But the herring fishery was going to open that week. And so they were getting their boats ready. And they weren't sure that they were going to be able to make it down 
an hour to drive in a two hour window to come and vote for me. So what we did is we talked to one of my supporters owns a local restaurant and we set up a burger and a beer for 20 bucks so that these guys could drive down, have the burger and a beer, get the deal on the dinner before they went back home. And like, you just, you got to get your people out. You got to drive that. You got to do the, that last little bit to drive people out, to get them to come and vote for you. So wow. Thursday night on the Sunshine Coast, we took a late ferry. We did a vote 8 a.m. till 10 a.m. in Squamish on Friday morning. We went up to Whistler Friday night. Voting was 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. A blizzard came in at 5 p.m. Couldn't see across the street by 5.30 p.m. And then we had to drive down in the snowstorm because voting was in West Vancouver on Saturday afternoon. And in all of those locations, we were driving around all day, knocking on people's doors, telling them, come out and vote. Today's the day. Oh, I forgot. I'll come right now. And it makes the difference, right? The 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 real estate take home is like, sometimes you just got to call people because yeah. they're not thinking about you Yes, and you call them and you remind them that you're a person and you're a competent realtor. And then the next day they're out at dinner and they bump into someone who's thinking of moving. That's oh, so you've got to talk to my friend, Keith. That's so true. You know, if you're not there, so true. you'll be forgotten. Yeah. You know, I was talking to somebody uh, while well, I interviewing somebody a few weeks ago uh, for a podcast. It'll be released in a little while. And he said, you know, what's really funny about real estate is he said that, you know, I could phone a whole bunch of people today and it doesn't mean it. I get nothing from it. I phoned a bunch, of, nothing from it. Not, you know, he goes, I can have five days in a row like that. And then he said, for whatever reason, all of us in the next week, everything starts to happen. And it's, you know, what happens, all those calls I made the week before, they result in results the week or two after. We're also now people, you're top of mind, you know, and they're reaching out to you. And he goes, it's, you know, he says, I, I never get down on myself because I had a slow week in terms of results. He said, the secret is the behaviors, the behaviors, the behaviors, the behaviors. So take us through your campaign. I'm, I'm really interested to know your campaign. And then we'll talk about sort of next steps, what you're going to do now. So how did you, you know, brand new, don't really know a lot of people, got to go sell a whole bunch of memberships. Yeah. So what did, what was your campaign plan? Yeah. So membership sales were two main sources. Uh, one, the real estate community. Um, I'm well known in the real estate community. I, I think I'm well respected in the real estate community. I've been a strong advocate for, you know, greater regulation and ethics. Um, uh, I'm vocal inside of, you know, uh, public policy issues affecting real estate. So uh, realtors were a big group of mine. I did a couple of realtor housing roundtables um, on policy. I had the shadow minister of housing, a gentleman named Scott Aitchison with the Conservative Party. He came out and did a couple events with me and we talked to realtors, sold some memberships there. And then their family, you know, realtors married, realtors, two 15-year-old kids. Uh, you know, that's four votes. So that was one. And then two was converting the existing membership. I was able to secure a lot of prominent endorsements from uh, former councillors and current mayors. Uh, the former member of parliament endorsed me. And he uh, he was an old conservative stalwart who had been the leader of the Canadian Alliance at one point. So I had a lot of the the high level endorsements. And then our ground game was was good as well. Um, we were the only campaign that sent out two separate mail pieces to the membership, which I think had some value to it. And we were able to do that because of campaign donations. There's limits on what you can raise and spend in a campaign. And that adds a whole other challenge to it. Nominations used to just be wild west. You could, you just, you could fund your own campaign, spend a hundred thousand bucks, do whatever you needed to do. But now you're in this limited campaign environment and it it levels the playing field, but it just creates some new challenges. So we were able to raise the maximum amount of money and ultimately spend the maximum amount of money to make sure we got it across the line. Hmm. Now, what was the maximum amount you could raise? It, it's somewhere in the $26,000 range. So okay. you can raise more, but if you raise more, it's just, it goes to the party, like goes to the local association afterwards. Right. So it's a really tax inefficient way to do it i mean we just we targeted our our donors we were able to raise 26 and we spent 25 9 or something like that yeah. and, you know and you're just watching the numbers at the end you're like oh i gotta print some flyers but maybe just let's print 200 instead of 300 because i don't want to you just don't want to go over that limit and you got to be really careful with it 
Right. Yeah. So, you know, so interesting because it's just like people start in real estate, right? You know, in the same way you're doing the same thing. So, okay. So now what is the plan? So we have uh, in Canada, we have an election coming up this fall. No, um, um, next fall. Is next the fall, I'm sorry. Fixed election date. Yeah. Which the liberals have legislation on the table to move. So yeah, the, current fixed, the current fixed election date is October 20th. Right. They're moving it to October 27th because all of the guys who got elected and all of the people who got elected in 2019 qualify for their pension on October 21st, 2025. I know. It, it's, yeah, I, I know. I read that. Now they're saying it's because of a holiday. Of yeah, Diwali. Um, right. I don't, I haven't talked to anybody in the Indian community yet who thinks of Diwali as a celebration that couldn't also coincide with a federal election. Right. So ostensibly anyway. the reason is Diwali. The cynic yeah. in me might suggest otherwise. Yeah, I know. Well, they could move it forward too, right? They might move it forward because Jagmeet qualifies for his pension in the spring. Yeah. So there's, you know, he might give up, on, <laughs> might give up Justin right. Trudeau. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. So, so what is your plan? And we're going to get into your real estate business in a minute because you know you're balancing both right now. So yeah. here you are. You're now the candidate, right? Um, now you want to be a member of parliament, and of course to do that, you know, Pierre has to get elected. Um, so what's your plan now? Uh, knock on doors. Yeah. That that's it's actually the entirety of the plan. Um, we can get through this section pretty quick, Rich. There are approximately 30,000 households in the newly redistributed riding. Um, I plan to knock on every door 1.5 times, uh, you know, knocking on more beneficial poles than others. And, you know, some condo towers you can't get into. Some areas are inaccessible because of security gates. Like our, our riding includes the top side of West Vancouver, which is, the British properties, the most wealthy neighborhood in the country, and small rural parts of Pemberton, um, trailer parks in, on the Sunshine Coast, and beautiful waterfront homes. Like it's, it, there's there's nothing homogenous about this riding. So there's a whole bunch of different types of doors we need to knock on, but we just need to go knock on them. On I don't know if you saw the photos of this on Instagram on Tuesday of this week. Uh, Pierre came out to West Vancouver and Pierre and I went door knocking. He didn't come to give a speech or a rally. He didn't want to talk to, didn't want to preach to the converted. He said, Keith, I'm coming to town. Let's go knock on some doors of people who you don't know. And that's what we did. Uh, we just went and knocked on people's door. You can imagine you and Sue are sitting at home and the local candidate shows up with Pierre and he just walks up to your door and introduces himself. And people are just like, what, what is happening right now? Yeah, that's very, very cool. And some some people were, you know, uh, some people were like, I I haven't decided who I'm voting for. This is interesting. I'm glad you came. Some people were overwhelmingly supportive. Like, you know, I want a photo. We got to get rid of this guy. When's the election? It, uh, it was great, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to go and talk to people. And then the way campaigns work is you identify your vote. So you, you go to the door, you talk to people, you figure out if they're going to support you. And if they are going to support you, you make sure they get out and vote. And you remind them, you know, a week before and a day before and the day of, and you make sure they come down and vote for you. Yeah. Now, has the Conservative Party influenced you and how to campaign? Is this is this what they say to do? Um. Yeah, because it's the right thing to do. Like, it's just the it's the best way to campaign. Right. Um, a lot of this is driven from Pierre's experience. So Pierre's been elected as the member of parliament for Carleton, which is an Ottawa area riding for quite a long, like 2005, I think he got elected. When he got elected, he beat David Pratt, who was the liberal defense minister under Paul Martin. And Pierre had no business beating David Pratt, but Pierre outworked him at the doors. And to this day, Pierre will door knock his riding two or three times a year. Hmm. He will go through and just like every week he's out there knocking on doors in his riding. And as leader, he's done this. He goes to rallies and he stands at the end of every rally. He'll be 600,000 people in the room. He'll stand in the photo line until every single person is an, has had an opportunity to talk with him and get a photo. And can you imagine how much you would understand 
the fabric of a nation if you talk to 150,000 of its citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's what we as candidates need to do in our writings. Yeah. I need to go talk to, you know, if I'm knocking on 30,000 doors over multiple, you know, over a year and a half, I'm going to talk to tens of thousands of people. It's it's likely that I will have 25 or 30,000 conversations about the needs that people have in our writing. Mm -hmm. That will give me a fundamental understanding of the fabric of my writing, which will make me a better member of parliament ultimately. It'll it'll allow me to better communicate to people, um, communicate back to them what I've heard from them and communicate mm -hmm. back the solutions. So the party's influence is we have an example of a leader who has rallied a nation around him. Like we haven't seen people crowds this big for a political leader in since Trudeau Sr. So he's done that by individual conversations, one on one. And there's an air game, like, you know, there's going to be a social media war and there's going to be misinformation that comes out and there's going to be, you know, news stories and issues that you have to respond to. But when, you know, my focus is not preaching to the converted, my focus is talking to people who haven't decided who they're going to vote for, mm -hmm. introducing myself so they can see that I'm a, I'm a very reasonable, competent, capable, intelligent um, dedicated public servant who wants to take their voice to Ottawa and be part of the team that helps clean up the mess that this country has left behind. Yeah, it's so yeah, the whole process to me is is so interesting. But you know, even with technology and the digital world and social media, guess what? It still comes down to you got to go meet people. You got to shake their hands. Now, let's face it: in British Columbia, it tends to be left leaning. Yeah, there. So the political spectrum, everybody always thinks the political spectrum is is left or right. right, and it's actually a circle. So at the far end of the circle, you've got like your your blue collar union labor worker. Well, that guy is just as likely to vote for well this time this election he's going to vote for Pierre. Right, that that blue collar worker because his paycheck has been decimated by the policies of the current government, but he used to be a staunch labor labor union guy who would vote for the NDP, and he does not see his his values reflected in Jagmeet Singh and the current NDP. That guy didn't come through the whole spectrum. He didn't come Jagmeet all the way back to Justin over to Pierre. He just popped from Jagmeet to Pierre at the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. That. Um, just that small, think of that small town values. If you know, if I had to sum it up in one thing, small town blue collar values, mm -hmm. those could go NDP or they could go conservative. Um, in a lot of British Columbia, politically, we are in a three way race where, in order for the NDP to win, there needs to be a strong conservative candidate. And in order for the conservative candidate to win, there needs to be a strong NDP candidate. So in some of our writings, we're fighting the NDP. In our writing, I'm up against a liberal incumbent, um, and the NDP is consistently in third place. Mm. But it's highly probable that a green MLA will get a, a provincial member will get elected in a, a part of my writing, in part of the overlay. And in in British Columbia, our provincial writings don't exactly match the federal ones like they do in Ontario. But part of that writing is green. Squamish is very, um, you know, e environmentally conscious. It's outdoor, recreational. So it's a. There's so many different elements to British Columbia politics. Yeah. And trying to, you know, there. It's not red and blue. It's mm -hmm. red, orange, green, and blue, and we run the full spectrum out here. Right. So okay. So let's talk about sacrifice here because you have. Uh, so how many people on your real estate team right now? There's. Um, basically three licenses and uh, two licensed assistants because we don't have lock boxes and a team manager. Okay. And I'm well, one of those three licenses. Okay. Now, is this a financial sacrifice for you, what you're doing? It is an enormous financial sacrifice. Tell us about that. Well, I, I don't want this. <laughs> I don't want any misconception here that this comes across as a complaint. Um, I'm, I'm answering this because you asked the question. I am aware of the sacrifice that I'm about to make in, in my career. I'm a very successful realtor. I've had a wonderful career. Um, I have made some money doing that. 
and the money I've made has afforded me the opportunity to have the flexibility to go and do this. Uh, let me let me give you a quick story from that I, I told a lot of people during the nomination. When I was 15, my mom, uh, we lived in Powell River and my mom and stepdad got divorced and it culminated in a bank foreclosure of our house, um, creditor protection, and my mom and I had to leave Powell River and we moved into a 600 square foot rented apartment. Uh, when I was at university, one day I couldn't pay for groceries because the bank account had been taken up in the divorce proceedings. So I don't come from money. Um, everything I have in the world, I was able to earn over the last you know, 20 years of my career. Uh, I was able to help my mom retire in 2021, and I bought her a condo. And my mom now lives in a, a, a condo that's twice as big as that little one we lived in right on the river in Richmond. And to me, that is the opportunity that Canada used to offer, where I, in a single generation, could change the trajectory of my family in multiple generations, because I've changed my mom's life and my son's life. He will never worry. And my mom will never worry again from what I've been able to accomplish. And that's the opportunity that Canada used to offer that we have lost. I don't think someone graduating today could have that same experience that I did to change the fortunes of their family um, at, at the level that I did. And look, it's possible and there's anomalies, but it was far more achievable when I did it. I'm one of many, and today it would be one of very few who could accomplish that. Mm. And so that was a lot of my impetus for running. And so the financial cost of running, the opportunity cost is great. I mean, I'm I'm spending less time prospecting for listings and more time prospecting for memberships. I'm not making as many sales as I was. But I explain it this way. Most realtors I know, uh, most high-performing realtors I know have some sort of side gig and not necessarily a paying gig. They're marathon runners, they're ultra marathon runners, um, they're doing triathlons. Uh, at one point I built a house, I syndicated some uh, apartment complexes. So we're always working in a couple different things. This is my other thing right now. It just happens to be really public. And so people are aware of it. But anytime you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying no to some of my prospecting time in favor of pursuing this path to, to help represent the, the people of West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Cedar Sky Country. Uh, that said, I'm still running my real estate practice. And you know, I'd, I'd still love to see referrals from other agents. We've, we've got a great team and I'm, you know, I'm not spending 60 hours a week campaigning. But I'm spending that 15 or 20 hours a week out there talking with people. Um, and it's, it's not entirely different than what any other agent does as their second hobby. Mm -hmm. Mine's just really public. Yeah, that was, that was really well said. So let's talk about this. Um, because I know you run a, a very good real estate team and you've definitely had a lot of success. And, you know, you've obviously done well with your investments in real estate as well. That's really helped you. Um, so. If, if you were talking to somebody, because what I love, I've always said this, and you probably heard me say this before, I have such great respect for people that have many interests, or at least a few interests, right? I'd say, I think one of the easiest things to do is go work 80 hours a week, like or 90 hours a week. Like, like That's an easy play, right? I think one of the hardest things to do is to you know, build a successful business while you're enjoying your other loves in life at a really deep level. When I see people do that, I go like, when you took the eight months off, I'm ah, good for you, right? Like, man, like, are you kidding me? Like, that's so cool. You know, you-, you I spend... remember you were a little skeptical at the beginning of that. I was, no, I was, I wasn't skeptical of you taking the time off. I was skeptical of you being able to maintain your income, right? Yeah. Like that, that's where my worry for you was. I'm going, because I get to remember, I know your past really well. And yeah. you know what I mean? So- and I just didn't want to see you get stressed financially, I guess, right? But yes, I was I was definitely skeptical about can he maintain the income? Um, and you know, you still learn that year, I think it was seven figures, and, and that was with eight months off. Now, I, you know, which is unbelievable, right? That's a yeah. real business. That's yeah. where instead of a, you know, you're sort of an owner of a business rather than necessarily the operator of the business every single day. And I think that's a cool thing. 
So let's say, and you've, you're a guy that's has done it multiple times. Like you took the eight months off. You've also enjoyed extended periods of time at your place in Hawaii, right? Um, you know, you 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 know you live in Vancouver, but you also have a place in Whistler, right? And you know, like you said before, we got started this podcast. You, you just drove up from or down from the mountain today, right? And so you've been really good at that balance where you could really pursue interest beyond just making money. And I think that's a challenge for a lot of people. And life is really short. And I've always said, I think it's important that we be honest with ourselves about that and make sure that we're really enjoying the journey. And I've always said, build a business that fully supports the life you want to live. What advice would you give to somebody that's grinding out there every single day, earning a living, and maybe not doing everything they want to do with their life? What would you say to them? Well, it's it's tough when you're just earning a living, right. right? Because you just need to earn a living. And in in my market, things are really expensive. In Canada, things are really expensive and hard right now. So in a lot of cases, there's not really an option for someone who's not earning a living uh, or, or who's there's not a lot of options for someone who's just earning a living. But if you're if you're at all you know, largely successful in the business you're running and your audience is disproportionately successful. Um, I'll make a book recommendation, which uh, which changed a lot of the way I thought about this stuff. Um, Die With Zero. I don't know if you read this one. This, this book angered me to no end. I was reading it and I was complaining about it every night. And Stephanie's like, why are you reading this book? You're just complaining about it all the time. I was like, I don't know. I and it really changed my thought process around when when you stop building up the the fortune or the wealth or the savings and when you start enjoying it a little bit and when you even start depleting it mm-hmm. um you and i have a mutual friend chris whitehead who retired from real estate and bought a big boat and struggled for a couple years trying to figure out like oh i'm going to be worth less next year than i was the year before and he was the right age to do that. I'm probably not quite the right age, but I made the decision about two years ago before I'd even decided to run that I was I wanted to live a little more because I'm at a unique phase in my life. So we have a, a, an almost, by the time this airs, we've got a four-year-old son. And for the last four years, I'm going to say my net worth has not grown in any large portion. And it's because I've spent my time differently. I've spent my time with him. I I spent money on childcare so that when I came home at the end of the day, I could spend time with him and I didn't have to, you know, clean the house and do you know, all the things that go around having a child. Um, we just kind of shifted some of our priorities on that. We We sold our... We had a big family home. We sold our home. We we now spend our our time. We we rent an apartment in the city, and we have a uh, our home in Whistler. Um, we just shifted a lot of that, and it, it, it a lot of it wasn't a good financial decision, but it wasn't a bad financial decision either. It just wasn't about growing, um, growing our business, you know, growing our wealth from our business. It was about enjoying it. And the concept of die with zero is. Your, your life is made up of experiences and memories. And if you die with money, you could have had another experience and you could have created a different memory. So what are you doing with the money if not trading it for an experience? And I'm kind of doing that with a run for parliament because there is an opportunity cost, but I'm going to go have this incredible experience of, of campaigning and talking with tens of thousands of people. And I'm going to learn a lot. And you know, I, I believe I'm going to get elected and then I'm going to get to go be part of a team that takes the country and points it in a new direction. I'm I'm applying to be on the board of directors of a G8 nation. That's what's happening right now. This is a this is a serious business. It's a serious opportunity. Um, and, I, and I I believe I can help. Um, and so that's that's what shifted in my mind. And that's why the opportunity cost doesn't really bother me. I'm I'm still going to be able to pay my bills. Um, but to your initial question, which I've taken far too long to answer, 
of what do you do to what advice do you give to someone who's just making a living you know um, keep making that living and maybe make a little bit more of a living and get yourself on more solid footing and it might mean spending less in some cases you might just be spending in the wrong places but get yourself to the point where you can um you know where you can enjoy other things that are and you can enjoy things that aren't expensive yeah just yeah. the opportunity to go to go to go for a, the the freedom to go for a hike yeah you know it's it's so cool like i i it's funny you, you talk about the book die with zero somebody mentioned that book to me about i was in phoenix a, i don't know a month ago or so and i wrote it down and i actually have it on my list to read but i have not read it yet so every time two people mention a book to me it's i, I read it right and and it's so funny because every once in a while you get the same book mentioned in a short period of time, which is the weirdest thing ever, right? Like you yeah. just all the books in the world. How do two people from completely different, you know, disciplines mention the same book? So I, I'm definitely going to read that book. But uh, yeah, that's really, really well said. And I also think we got to be careful sometimes. I think people, you know, they create a lifestyle for themselves that they become a slave to their lifestyle. And you know, you spend your whole life trying to keep up, right? And you know, you've heard me say it before, but, you know, always said that own everything, let nothing own you because, you know, two people are owned by, by their things. Right. You know, and, and you know, it could be a house, could be two houses, could be cars or whatever. Right. But 20, 2021 <clears throat> did this to realtors. Yeah. Right. We all, we all had our best year ever. And if you said, if you didn't have your best year ever in 2021, <laughs> you know, what were you doing? You're an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but a, a lot of realtors have had to pull back. I've seen a lot of realtors have to sell off that one investment property. Um, it, it got, you know, it got a little out of control. Yeah. Well, I had a, we had a conversation. Um, so as you know, I spend some of my winters down in Florida and, and in the area that I live, there's eight of us all from my original hometown, uh, hometown of Peterborough, which is crazy. Right. And yeah. that's how I ended up there. Cause I went to visit one, seven years ago for new year's and four months later i bought right you know so i've just added to the amount of people that live in there originally from peterborough and i see these people more in the the winter i see in the summer because i'm in toronto and they're up in peterborough so unless there's a wedding or something i, I really don't see them but anyway so my buddy three doors down uh, a great guy uh, his name's paul mcleod and he's got a, a very like it's a really nice boat right and he can afford it he pays cash for everything right like he's you know he's done well for himself and uh, so anyway, he was talking to a buddy of his who finances boats and he's like, and he's always really interested in the economy, right? He goes like, you know, so he's talking to his buddy. He goes, I got a question for you. He goes, what percentage of people actually finance their boats? And the guy almost go, well, what are you talking about? Everybody. Paul goes, no, not everybody. He goes, I'm telling you, almost everybody. Now, you know, like what, 95%, 97%? And, you know, here Paul goes out and he buys a boat. And Paul's theory is, if I can't pay for it, I don't buy it, right? And, you know, he's buying boats worth, like he's actually buying another one right now. It's worth 600 grand. So he's going to trade his in. He's buying this other $600,000 boat. Now he can afford it and that's all cool, right? Um, and I don't have a boat because he has one, which is a cool yeah. thing, right? Because why would I want a boat? The only thing I don't like is, you know, at least once a year, I got to fill it up. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm sitting watching the gas pump. I'm going, really? Like, you know, how many hundreds of dollars goes into this thing? But that's a twenty five hundred dollar fill. Oh, it's it's insane, yeah. right? But I, I I look at it and I say, like, it's it's a lot of people get themselves in that hole. And I think you said something there. Sometimes maybe you need to change your lifestyle, right? So that you know you put yourself in a position that you can make decisions for freedom, right? Instead of trying to keep up. Okay, so here's a just in closing this out, Keith. First of all. I love you, man. I want to congratulate you. Uh, I wish you nothing but success. And I truly hope that um, I personally know you as an MP someday, and then I'll start to call in all the favors, but that's another story. Um, but what can people do, the listeners? Because let's face it, a lot of people listening to this, many of them know you, many of them don't know you, right? Yeah. Um, what can they do to support you? Yeah. So uh, number one, I'm I'm still a realtor and I've, you know, I got to get that message out because unlike a lot of candidates who have corporate jobs, who just continue to get paychecks every two weeks, I don't have that opportunity. So I still have to, I'm still prospecting. I'm still listing and selling homes, negotiating deals and referrals from other agents in other markets. 
are going to be an important part of helping me continue to run my business. So I'm still in, I'm still a realtor. I still need business. Um, politically, if you know people, and I, I think realtors are disproportionately conservative people. Mm -hmm. um, if if people are are willing to help out, uh, the 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 two things we need are volunteers. So if if you find yourself in the Lower Mainland and want to come out and knock on some doors, we I'm always up for that. And obviously financial donations. So my business website is keithroy.com. Our campaign website is keithroy.ca. And you will you go on there, you click on the donate button, you can make a donation. That donation is tax creditable. Um, so example, if you donate $400, you get a $300 tax credit. So the net cost to you is only $100. And the benefit to my campaign which we'll use to, you know, have have signs and pay campaign managers and all those things. The net benefit to my campaign is four hundred dollars. People can donate up to seventeen hundred and twenty five dollars um, in any given calendar year, so they can donate in twenty three, uh, or they could donate in twenty twenty four, and they can donate next year in twenty twenty five. Uh, but those are the the two things. So, you know, obviously I, I like business, and secondly, donations to the the campaign would be very appreciated. Don't be fooled by the poll numbers. Um, it is in order to defeat Justin Trudeau and you know elect Pierre as the prime minister and get Canada pointed in a new direction, we are going to have to do an enormous amount of work on the ground at every riding across this country. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin Trudeau has proven himself as a very capable campaign campaigner over the years, um, if, if, if not so much an incompetent governor and steward of finances, uh, but do not underestimate the government that's in power and how much they will spend to buy your votes. We need to do the work on the ground, and I want to be a part of that team that uh, that wins and, and gets the country going again. Good stuff. Well, you know you got my support, buddy. I thank and, you for that. Uh, yeah, no, seriously. And, um, you know, I don't usually get too political on this, but, you know, I'm definitely a conservative. Um, and, uh, and, you know, a lot of people say to me, they go, you know, well, Justin Trudeau, you know, everybody's just sick of him. I go, listen, you can say we want to, but Justin Trudeau, he's a good politician. He's a very sure. good, don't, don't take that away from him. I'm not saying he's, he's good at many other things, but he is a damn good politician. And that's how he stayed in power, right? He won three elections and we need to make sure it's not four. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate your time today. I hope people will uh, take the time to support you in one of the two ways, or maybe both that you suggested. And I know you'd really appreciate it. You do a great job as a realtor. You've got a great team there as well. Uh, so people can rest assured you'll do a real good job for them. And and uh, I just wish you luck. And uh, I, uh, I look forward to calling in some favors when you're an MP. I, I think you have a slight misconception about the role of a member of parliament and how I much know. power we have. I know. Well, I'm hoping just get a message to Pierre for me. That's all I'm asking. You know, yeah. well, well, I I saw Pierre earlier this week. We we talk with some frequency, and uh, Pierre's the kind of guy who will who will listen. Yeah, he will listen to you. He will listen to me. He'll listen to every everybody in Canada, and we'll all be better off when he's our prime minister. Yeah. Well, thanks, my man. I appreciate you being here. Thanks, Rich. Join us at richardrobbins.com for more in-depth insight and training to build your business and your beautiful life. And remember to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single beautiful episode.